There are a lots of names and places going on in just the first five verses. We have Bethlehem and Judah twice. Moab is talked about twice. There is Elimelech and Naomi and Melon and Cleon. I want to say Cleon every time. There is Orpha and there is Ruth. And my question and our thoughts should be, why is it not just a man and his wife and two sons left Israel and went to Moab? where the sons got married and then eventually died. What's with all the detail? Why is these geographical places important that they are named twice in five scriptures? Why do we have this old name, the Ephrathites? Well done. (laughs) For Bethlehem, the old name of the people who are the tribe that gathered around there from the tribe of Caleb, if you want to go home, well, the people of Caleb, if you want to go home and do some homework. If Bethlehem spoke to fruitfulness, it speaks to geography and it speaks to genealogy of people belonging in place for a very long time. I can fuck up up a back to not New Zealand. If I do my mihi or my pepeha, I have to go back to where my nana and papa were from, which is in a whole other country and a whole different place I have never seen. My mountain would not be a mountain I know. My river would not be a place I know. And the people that I have come from, I don't know of them. But in this story, they are people of this particular land back many generations from the time when it was conquered and God brought the people in these people have been here from the sons of Judah and Tamar come this line where we have these people So it has to be more than just a man and his family left and went to another land because this is a story about deep hurt and big challenges and loss as you leave a place that is yours to go to another place. But we remember that Ruth is also the link between judges and kings and also from kings to Jesus. So the prophecy of the Messiah has to come in here too. We're already getting inklings that from Bethlehem, remember Bethlehem, a Messiah will come. Later on in the Minor Prophets in Micah 5, chapter 2, you have this. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathath, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over all of Israel, whose origins are from old in the ancient times. It all starts to come together. God is not absent or above his people, but among and from. He knows their pain and trials and tribulations. And of course, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, fulfills this policy. And then we have Moab, which is clearly just not Israel. And the sons they marry, who are also not Israel. They are not keepers of the laws of God and the purity of him. But what about all these personal names? Why do we know that Elimelech means God is my king, except he goes off to Moab? Hmm. Know me, pleasant, gentle, and beautiful. What a great name. Melanin and Cleon, weak and failing. Orpha, the cloud or the shadow, and Ruth, companion and friend. My own name means meadow edge or clearing on a bank. (laughs) Woo! (laughs) It's just a name that my family liked. Um, I like to think that I'm beautiful, like, you know, a meadow's edge or a clearing on the bank, but something is being said here. The writer is making a point. The sons who die are called weak and failing. And Ruth, the one who comes to stay and live, is called companion and friend. Naomi, at the beginning of the story, is pleasant and gentle, and by the end of this very chapter, she is asked to be called Mara, or bitterness. And so we are left with this verse that both Maon and Cleon are dead, and Naomi was left with her, without her two sons and husband. 
And we needed Mike to put a cliffhanger soap opera as soon as we got to the end, because like this is the cliffhanger. What does an older woman do in a land that is not her own with two sons and two mouths to feed? If there was ever a Christmas cliffhanger soap opera, this is the time. So when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people and provided food for him, she and her daughters-in-law left that place and prepared to return home. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and me. And may the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the homes of another husband. And then she kissed them goodbye and wept aloud. And, said, and they said to her, we will go back to you with your people. And there is something interesting here about this announcement that food was now returning to Israel, that the famine was over. It gives us a framework for what Naomi is thinking all the way through this book. It says that the Lord has come to the aid of the people. And later on in this chapter, it is the direct hand, this direct hand of providence comes up again. That God is active and ongoing for the provision of his people and the life of the nation. This is the worldview of the time, that everything starts and finishes with God. Perhaps something we forget when we put petrol in our car and we go to get the groceries, and we pay with our money that we earn from our work. (laughs) Well, yes, but everything starts and finishes with God. God is at work restoring the fortune of his people. And we remember that Naomi is a smaller version of what was happening for the nation of Israel. So God was about to provide and refresh and refill Naomi, so he was about to do the same for the people of Israel, bringing them back and returning them. In God's providence, Naomi returns and is drawn back. As God provided in the time of Exodus and in the desert, as God provided this new land, he is providing still for the comfort of his people. And this fits too with the language of shuv, which is the language of return, which is a covenant promise. This language of covenant promises is used all the way through the Bible from Noah to Abraham to David through Jesus and the Jesus who talks about it. There is a covenant that God will be and will be for his people. And you have this language in the book of Ruth which talks about return, this language of shuv. It is a covenant language, a promise of God. And I think I've got a slide for it coming. It's this thing called, I will be your God and I will give you a home and I will bless you and you will be a blessing to the nations. And this was the promise made to Abraham when he met God in a tent. And instead of signing a contract that you then send to your lawyers and your lawyers send to their lawyers and the lawyers send back to you and charge you $4,000, both parties take a great vow and usually they split an animal. But this time, God puts Abraham to sleep, and he himself walks down this aisle, so you guys would be dead animal, and you guys would be half a dead animal, and instead of working together and saying, hey, if this covenant goes wrong, this is, our, this is the cost. God puts Abraham to sleep and walks himself down the aisle and says, if this relationship, if this covenant goes wrong, it is on me. So among this covenant language is always this promise that God will provide everything, but also a warning, a returning language. Stop what you are doing. Turn back. Come back. If you continue on this path, something is going to happen and no good will come of it. Please come back. I will provide for you. Return. Come home. This is the language of the 
<laughs> I'm not good at Hebrew. It is used in the story of the prodigal son who returns to the home of his father. It is used in the books of the prophets to call the people back to return to the covenant, to this relationship they have with their God. This is the language used in youth where Naomi is called and decides to return. She is coming back home. But it says in our gospels that, sorry, in our, our Bible, that she did not expect her daughters in law to come with her. Three times she called on them to return, to go back. You see, as confident as Naomi was that something was going on in Israel, she was sure it was not for the daughters of Moab. So she said, You need to return. You need to go home. But regardless, they turned to her and they pleaded with her. So the story of Ruth is about returning, returning to a homeland, returning to a place that many, 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 many generations have belonged to and finding home in that place. Because it seems that Naomi and her daughters-in-law were on a quick path to death and destruction as they were away from that covenantal relationship. In verse 11, Naomi tries again. She says, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? I am going, I'm not going to have any more sons. And who would become your husband? Return, she says, my daughters. And I'm too old to have a husband. And even if there was hope for me, she's quite dramatic. Even if I had a husband tonight <laughs> and I gave birth to sons, would you even wait till they grow up? Would you main, remain unmarried to them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than you because the Lord's hand has turned them against me. And at this they wept aloud and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. It seems the good, right decision, right? Naomi is old. She's not getting a husband tonight. There's definitely no kids coming. 18 or so at least years. Mm. It makes good sense. But Ruth clung to her. So Naomi tries again, verse 15. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her God's Go back with her. But Ruth replied, Do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. And your people will be my people. And your God will be my God. And where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if even death separates me from you. And when Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Gold star, Ruth. What a good daughter-in-law you are. What a lovely remark to your mother-in-law who has lost everything. But this is also one of these vows that gets used in a wedding ceremony. Um, and it speaks to loyalty and compassion. But it is more than that. Somewhere along the line in the years that that family had been in Moab, Ruth has met God. Well, Ruth says, I'm coming with you, Naomi, and everything where you go, I will go. She is saying, my identity and my belonging is now found with your God. Everything that she knew of Moab and everything that was told of her that was good, she has said, no, I am not going there because there is nothing, but your God will be my God. And I wonder how Ruth came to this conclusion, apart from the fact that God was speaking to her, because Naomi doesn't seem to think much of God at all. <laughs> Naomi doesn't think that too much good has come for the nation of Israel or for her family or for herself. Because she says, the Lord has turned his hand against me and I am bitter. So what revelation has come to Ruth, even though she has lived in this house for, of Naomi? What has come over 10 years as three widows sat in a household? What has Naomi said or prayed or believed or fought or struggled with, that even though Naomi doesn't seem particularly stoked with God, Ruth still 
loves and has vowed to serve this God. Ruth is already committed. And so now these two women go to Bethlehem. And when they arrive there, the whole turn, town turns up and they're stirred. And the woman can exclaim, can this be Naomi? Do not call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Lord Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune on me. So they returned. You'd think she'd be a little bit more happy to return, right? <laughs> to come back into the land of covenant promise, to come back to the land of her families and her people, to come back to the place where there is plenty. But she turns up and saying, I call me Mara, I am bitter. This is the Lord and he's... Ah. And I want to say fair enough. <laughs> Away from home for at least 10 years, a dead husband and two dead sons. Nothing much seems to be going right for her. And now she lands at home with Ruth, another mouth to feed. I went away full, she says, but I have returned and I am afflicted and I am empty. Now, considering what Ruth has just said to her, I can only imagine Ruth's awkwardness, who's like, hi, <laughs> I'm going with you, cool. Did you forget? <laughs> Naomi is achingly honest with the people of her town. When she gets back to her hometown, she doesn't pretend that everything is fine. She doesn't try to cram her pain into a closet and then shut the door and put a lock on it. Rather, she invites by the presence of her daughter-in-law and by the words of her mouth for people to look on and see her frustrations. She asserts quite boldly that God has dealt bitterly with her, and that God himself has brought calamity on her, and she admits that she is empty. And her words, and I'm sure the presence of Ruth, this Moabitess, would make the people very uncomfortable. But laments often do. In a lament, there is utter humility and utter honesty. Because church lament is not a lack of faith. Because faith in my eyes in a coin. If you flip a coin, there is a head or a tail. On one side of our coin of faith, there is hope. And on the other side, there is lament. Lament is not a lack of faith, I tell you, but of expression of pain in it. How long, O oh Lord, called David. It was the working out of the same worldview that Naomi has held her whole life, that God is in control and that everything relies upon him. This is the power of someone calling out into the covenant promise. You said, if I was in this land, you would bless me. So where are you at work? Be at work, God, she is saying. And in her grief, and not stuffing it down or hiding it away, her faith is real and raw and gritty. And in realizing that God would allow her to grieve in such a way and say such things without killing her or striking her down, perhaps the people around her began to see that they could grieve their own losses without fear of God's disapproval. Perhaps, too, they could grieve and feel loss in a way that they didn't feel the judgment of being teary. Perhaps they could grieve knowing that they were not alone in grief, abnormal in their heart's feelings. Naomi's words were raw, but she spoke truthfully about God. She acknowledged that he was in control of all things and that ultimately everything is from him. Her theology still is profoundly God-centered and God-honoring. Lament is not a lack of faith, but an expression of pain in it. Underlyingly, Naomi's lament is a deep trust and understanding of God. Naomi is moving towards God with honesty. She has returned to Bethlehem. She has returned to the people of God. And she is realistically presenting what has happened to her. 
What is honest, my friends, is allowable. You are allowed to feel both the good and the bad, the highs and the lows in your faith. And I wondered if it is this honest faith that has attracted Ruth to the God of Israel. A God who was okay with someone saying, where are you? A God that didn't judge but reached out and brought comfort to the widow and the orphan. So often at church and in the spaces we interact with each other, we are all okay. I'm fine. How are you? Good. Great. Wonderful. (laughs) Not wonderful. Among us at any point, and it could be me at any point, or even you, there is the point where, God, you are not being who you said you are. Where are you in this situation? But when I come to church, I'll mediumly raise my hands because I don't want anyone to know. God is big enough for us to live authentically with him, authentic in our joy, authentic in our pain, authentic in our crying out, where are you in this situation you promised you would be? And I think that godly lament does not repel people from the gospel, but it instead draws them to a God who is big enough. What happens when? Where is God when my? Why didn't she? When my sister, my half-sister Kelly (laughs) Marie West, and I was Shelley Marie West, died in the hospital, my oldest brother looked at me, pulled a box of gloves out from where the nurses came in and threw it at my head and said, why didn't your God save my sister? And I said, I don't know, but I'm as sad as you are. And at her funeral, which I took, I stood there and I said, Kelly did not want to know God, but God still knew Kelly. God is big enough when people ignore him. God is big enough when we yell and are angry with him. God is big enough for our disappointments in him. He is big enough. And I know that he is big enough because he gave Naomi, who called herself Mara Bitter, the comfort of a friend in Ruth. Naomi is not empty. She does not come back with nothing. She has come back with a daughter-in-law who vowed to stay by her side. And God has not left us empty. He gives us the gift of people. T.S. Eliot says this. Oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having to neither wave of thoughts nor measure words, but to pour them all out just as they are, chaff and grain together, knowing that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keeping what is worth, keeping, and then with a breath of kindness blowing away the rest. Surely this was Ruth for Naomi. What a beautiful gift if this is what she was. What a beautiful gift to have a friend that you could be at peace with and hold your best and your worst And I love that Naomi was given the strength of Ruth. She was a blessing of God for her. She is a comfort of God for this woman of Israel. And I hope you all have Ruths in your life. I know that I have many. And my prayer is that you would be open enough to speak of your laments as well as your joys, of your hopes as well as your fears, and in that you will be held. But we have more than our own promise of Ruth. We have a more than Ruth. 
And in Isaiah 11, it talks about one who would come from the stump of Jesse, from the branch, he will bear fruit, and he will be wisdom and understanding, and he will be counsel and might, and he will bring the knowledge of the Lord. This is a friend who is just more than a friend for us. If you go on in Isaiah uh, chapter 11, it says that he is the one who will judge wisely, and he will be the ally of the poor, and he will do away with the wicked. As Ruth was a shoring up relationship for Naomi, so we have Jesus who is a shoring up of our relationship. He is a shoring up of us. That as we come to him with our lament, he does not kick us or squash us. He fills us with his wisdom and understanding, with his counsel and his might, with the knowledge of the Lord, which is his goodness and kindness and faithfulness and everlasting covenant love towards us. So there was a Ruth who was a redeeming relationship for Nomi. And I hope that there will be many redeeming relationships among this people and among this family. Because some of us at any given day can be a Naomi. And that's okay. Because we have a God who is big enough A God who is big enough to take our pain and is wise enough to be our counsel and is on the side of the Don Triton. And there is one who is our righteousness and his name is Jesus. So church, I'm telling you that Ruth is more than a love story. It is the story of redemption. And it provides a way literally for the ultimate redemption of come from David to Jesus. This is the family line. Ruth the Moabites is in the family line of Jesus but also metaphysically. There is a redeeming relationship in Christ open for all of us. And many of you know this in this room, and many of you have journeyed with this throughout long parts of your life, but I wonder if you have ever opened up to be fully honest in the day and the darkest of nights, raged against him and gone, it's okay, he still loves me. He is bringing me wisdom and understanding. He is my counsel and might, and I can be grumpy and angry, and I can cry out, God, you, where are you? And yet he is still there. He is the one who points the way to home and is waiting for us to return like the prodigal son. He is the one who comes not with a sword to win the battle, but gentleness and compassion and kindness and love. And so I'd like you, and I invite you, to take a moment. I'm making time. Think about your own redeeming relationships. Number one, be thankful for them. Be thankful for the people who have been Ruth to you. But also, be thankful for the people who have been Naomi to you who have shown you true and honest relationships with God and hard times and yet have still been faithful. And then, take a moment to reflect on that biggest of all redeeming relationships, the one of Jesus, who has called you his own, who comes to you with wisdom and understanding, with his counsel and might, with his welcome and his forgiveness and his mercy. Jesus who offered that his spirit would be with us until the end of the age, until we see him again face to face. Take a moment, we have time. Be thankful. Jesus, our pain and turmoil is not a surprise to you. That we mourn death and loss and brokenness is not a feeling that you don't know. Joseph died. You wept over a city. Your heart poured out for a people who were downtrodden and enslaved. You know what it means to be human. And you, you are our king. And you are big enough that when we rally and rage against you, you comfort us. 
You bring us home. You wait with arms opened and say, come here. Come home to the place of comfort. Come and return to the place there I am. And I will wrap my arms around you. You are a God that is big enough, and so we give thanks. We give thanks for the roots that you have given us that have been steadfast and faithful friends. We thank you too for the Naomi's that you have shown us, that in their distress and in their pain and their doubt, they still turn to you. They ask of you and demand where you are, but still cry out for you to be in that space. So we thank you for the Naomi's that you have shown us. But Lord, we are most, most, most thankful for this redeeming relationship of you. That in you, Jesus, we find home. And in you, Jesus, we find wisdom and counsel and peace. And in you, we have returned to the God who made us. May our feet and our hearts and our minds shift more so towards you. More towards home and covenant and goodness found in you. We know that you are waiting to welcome us home. Amen.